So it's good to be back and it's good to see you. And if you are with us today because of one of these objections, thank you for coming in and taking the time to at least explore some of the things uh, that, that might be causing you a difficulty in terms of understanding or accepting uh, whether there is a God or what is about Christianity in amongst all the other claims and everything else that's going on in the world in which we live. The title of today, I was really surprised to hear that actually this is one of the biggest objections, one of the biggest objections that people have to God, to Christianity and the church is this, why are Christians so hypocritical, nasty and judgmental? That's kind of what I want to look at. I remember visiting a church. I was with my then fiance, who became my wife, Belinda, and we visited the church, and we arrived late for a meeting. And uh, we sat in the back row. That's often where latecomers feel comfortable. And, and actually what happened was that the man who was leading the meeting halfway through got everyone on the back row to stand up. Now, I'm not going to do that. No, no, I won't. I'm not going to do that. And he got everyone on the back row to stand up. Then he got everyone else in the church congregation to turn around and face the people on the back row and say and pray for them that next time they wouldn't be so lazy and get here on time. <laughs> Surprisingly, I haven't been back to that church. Actually, it's not true. I, I got married in that church. And I was on time on that particular day. But people have had a lot worse than that. Sometimes people's treatment by the church has been appalling, awful, heartbreaking. Some of you here today have got very, very legitimate, very reasonable objections to the Christian faith, to the religion. Why? Because of the church and what it has done to you. I remember about a decade or so ago, I was involved in a school assembly. This was for five-year-olds. And I was playing a very key role within this uh, assembly, and that was Stuart the Squirrel, I think he was called. No, Sydney. I didn't get his name right. Sydney the Squirrel. And my wife was playing the part of Margaret the Rabbit. And this was the friendship of Sydney and Margaret, and we were puppeteers. And why a squirrel and a rabbit? Because they were the two puppets that we had. And I remember the dialogue of, of Sydney talking to Margaret. Margaret had pinched Sydney's jelly babies. And Sydney was very upset by this. And so Sydney said, Margaret, Margaret, if you don't give me back my jelly babies, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bite your bottom. For some, that was too much. In the audience that day, not just was a lot of five and six-year-olds, there was a man who were there who was making notes of everything that we did as a church and wrote a letter of complaint to the head teacher saying you used the word bottom in the assembly. Why? Because he and his family had been really hurt by this church in the past. I sat on the train with, with Belinda and Andy and Lynn at the time, coming back from a Christian conference. And, and it was a leadership conference, and the conductor, a very friendly chap, came along, started chatting to us, and found out that we'd been on this conference, church leaders, and he said, oh, which church is that? King's Church. Oh, I know about King's Church. Okay. I said, oh, my daughter has never been the same since going to King's Church. It is so damaged. And I listen, as it turned out, it wasn't this King's Church, <laughs> few. <laughs> but to be honest, it could have been. And it might be. And next week, it could well be. Because people have been really hurt as a result of the actions of Christians. And I get it, and I understand it. And you might have this objection, and I get your objection. I'm totally on board and on side with you. Sometimes how we Christians have behaved has been awful. Let's look at some of the objections. My objection is not to God, but to his so-called representatives on earth, paedophile priests, charlatan evangelistic millionaires. Why does God allow this? 
And when you read them a local paper about the local ongoings of a member of clergy who is now serving time in prison, and when you read of councillors writing and MPs writing to David Cameron saying, because you passed the gay marriage bill, then great judgment is going to come onto this country. And when people like a man called Yonggi Cho, who leads or led the largest church in the world in Korea, massive amount of respect, just got sentenced to three years imprisonment for embezzling millions of dollars. When we hear of these things, I get it, I understand. Another objection, having been abused by one church, I decided to try again with another, this time in the Church of England. And when I subsequently came out as a gay, I was judged and rejected. It is quite clear to me that church does not want me. There are even members of King's Church who, despite knowing me, will not even acknowledge me in the street. Do you know what? I get it. If that has been your treatment, and if we have been a part of that, or the church has been a part of that, please accept our sincere apologies for that. It is appalling. And I hate to see internet photos of Christians standing on marches with slogans and banners that say things like, God hates fags. It is wrong. Another objection, why is it that I have more Christian values being a non-church guy than some so-called Christians? I remember speaking to a young person one time, and they said to me, the reason I'm not a Christian is this. My friends condemn me for smoking, but they're sleeping with their boyfriends. Another said this, I have a friend called Mary. Mary is a gossiping Christian. I have another friend called Sarah. Sarah isn't a Christian and doesn't gossip. I'd rather be with Sarah than non-gossiping non-Christian. Another objection. If the church is meant to be a place where all can be welcome to come in, why has its actions meant that some people cannot access it because of fear about how they will be perceived within the church? A conversation that took place with a, a sex worker on the streets one night said to him, trying to reach out and trying to support this particular lady, have you ever thought about going to church? And she looked incredulous. She said, why on earth would I think of going to church? I feel bad enough already. And the final objection I'll point out today was this. It's not so much about the idea of God I object to, it's the Christians I have trouble with. Gandhi said this, I don't reject your Christ, I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. See, it's not surprising. It's not so surprising that this Christian message, which we Christians, we call the gospel, which means good news, doesn't seem so good news when we see apparent frauds and charlatans who are saying one thing and living in a completely different way. I just want to put out some assumptions. Okay, I think some of these assumptions that some of you will carry, or many of you. First assumption is this. Church is meant to be about love and kindness and tolerance. You are meant to accept me for who I am, even if that differs from what you believe, and even if you don't like it. And if you don't like it, you're not to point it out in any way or show your disapproval. That's the subtext to that assumption. A second assumption is this. Church is meant to have integrity, a moral compass with standards and authenticity. You are, subtext, meant to be beyond approach, practice what you preach. You, you set a standard, so therefore you live by that standard. And if you don't live by that standard, then you get all of the abuse that you deserve as a result of it. The third assumption is this. All Christians are probably hypocrites. Now, without wanting to offend and alienate many people within this congregation right now, I probably tend to agree to all of those statements. In part. To say all Christians are hypocrites is probably true some of the time. At some point, often for me daily, as a Christian, I will pretend to be something that I'm not. Let me just unravel a little bit what a hypocrite is and what a hypocrite isn't. So I think there's a little bit of confusion. A hypocrite was actually a Greek theatre term. An hour ago, I was standing on a theatre stage in the centre of town talking about this theatrical term called a hypocrite. Literally, it means a mask wearer. Someone would be on the stage, and they would have a mask on them. It wasn't the real them. It was a character. It was a persona that they were portraying. That was what a hypocrite. Now, in the Bible, we hear, we hear that Jesus actually got hold of this theatrical term and completely redefined it. He got hold of it, and he started to use it into the religious arena. Why? Because Jesus hated 
mask-wearing fakes. Let me just give you some warm-up. This is Matthew chapter 7. How can you say to your brother, said Jesus, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when all the time there was a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I say that was a warm-up. Later on in chapter 23 of the same book in the Bible, Jesus said this, message translation, I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you religious scholars, you Pharisees, you frauds, you hypocrites. Your lives are roadblocks to God's kingdom. You refuse to enter and you won't let anyone else in. You're hopeless, you religious scholars and Pharisees, you frauds. You burnish the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun, while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. You stupid Pharisees. Scour the insides and then the gleaming surface will mean something. You're hopeless, you religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You see how Jesus is winning these people. You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down it's all rotting bones and worm-eating flesh. People look at you and think you're a saint, but beneath the skin you are total frauds. So Jesus took this word from a theatre and completely gave it a whole new meaning. And the word was never the same. Now imagine how appalling it is now. The very thing that Jesus hated is the very thing that is so often and so commonly associated with the movement that he came to start. How tragic is that? That the word hypocrite is now a hallmark of the church as if it fits a hand in glove. Now I understand. I understand that the fakes and the phonies and the frauds who live, live their lives before God without even blushing. Those who publicly condemn others whilst they're doing the same in private. Hypocrisy. What is, what is not hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is not when someone fails your expectation of perfection. Someone falls short of your expected standard. Hypocrisy is not about catching out a Christian who says they follow Christ and by making a mistake, you say, ha, hypocrite. A Christian making a mistake is not hypocrisy. It's a mistake. A hypocrisy is having a Christian preacher stand on this platform, condemn homosexuality in the pulpit, then two days later get photographed in bed with my gay lover. That is hypocrisy. A Christian making a mistake is a mistake. (laughs) I went to a football match a few weeks ago at the Amex Stadium in Brighton. I went with Ollie. Ollie leads the church down in Centro. I had the tickets. And we were coming into Brighton, and then suddenly there was a traffic jam of other people wanting to go to the football match. And so we're on the filter lane, we're right, right alongside the new football stadium, and we couldn't get off because of the traffic jam. And I was getting very impatient because Ollie decided to stay in the lane that travelled up less than one mile an hour. And all these other cars on the second lane were just ooh, happily going past, all Brighton scarves and things like that. Ooh, and we're sitting here. And Ollie could tell that I was getting slightly agitated by this, by the fact that I said, Ollie, turn into the other lane and move on. But it, it, he's got, he, could, he could get it. And eventually, after crawling about 50 foot in half an hour, he pulled out. He pulled out into the other lane, went to zoom forward to realise actually the lane in front was blocked and he had to come back into the lane and he ended up one car in front of where he was. <laughs> that was kind of embarrassing and humiliating for him, but he should have learned. And uh, you know, so I was in that situation. But to be honest, what was that about? It's just about me and my pride. For some reason, it was more important for me to be at that football match than the person in the car in front. I needed to be there more than you. Now, I love my wife, and I love my family dearly. But sometimes, I get cross and angry and express my crossness and anger with them in a way which isn't God-honoring. Other times, there'll be jealousies and insecurities that'll come out of me when I see other people getting kind of recognition or advance in various things. 
Sometimes I will have to battle my sexual desires, like many of you, even on a daily basis. Sometimes I'm apathetic in my relationship with God. I'm a pastor of a church. You get paid to have a relationship with God. Well, I'm sorry, but sometimes I'm apathetic in that. I'm currently on a diet. Again. <laughs> the reason I'm on a diet, Richard, I always look at you when I say that. I don't know why. The, and your wife always pats your belly every time I mention diet. <laughs> You're a very beautiful, handsome man. Don't get me spine. Okay. And the reason why I'm on a diet again is because in the past I've eaten in excess. Now, I've just about pretty much listed all of the seven deadly sins. <laughs> Pride, of envy, of wrath, of lust, of laziness, of gluttony and greed. And they're just some of the things that I end up doing on a daily basis. If you spend any time with me or sat down with my wife just for any seconds, you will realize and understand how far short I fall of what is the expected standard. The question is, does that make me a hypocrite? Well, if being a Christ follower means that I have to be perfect, then yes, I'm a hypocrite. However, I don't think that is the case. See, what is the opposite of hypocrisy? The opposite of hypocrisy is not perfection. The opposite of hypocrisy is authenticity, genuineness. Honest transparency, not controlled appearance. Living without the mask. See, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who is pretending to be something that they are not. I reckon we're probably all in danger, all a bit prone to this. Often we will try to be something, that we, we want to be someone that we're not, and so in order to be that someone, we will sometimes put on a bit of a persona. Even stuff like cosmetic surgery is booming in this country. Why? Because fake boobs or fake tans, all trying to be something that we are not in order to receive acceptance that we crave. It's all a front. All for show. It's wearing a mask. Matthew 23, Jesus said this, everything they do, those hypocrites, is for show. They just want to be in the spotlight. I reckon we're all in danger of being a bit prone to this. So if a Christian claims to be perfect, to be morally superior in any way, then they're being a fake. Jesus' teaching is this. He said this, keep it real. Love God. Seek God. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, don't pretend you are perfect. Because the moment that you pretend that you've got it right, that is the moment that hypocrisy comes out. 1 John says this in the Bible, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive, we con ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A Christian author called Philip Yancey wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace, and he kind of came to the conclusion that there was two groups of people that Jesus met. The first group of people were the sinners who knew it, and the second group were the sinners who denied it. With his first category of people, the sinners who knew it, grace acceptance, tolerance, compassion, forgiveness. To this second group of people who denied it, he called them hypocrites, confronted, and he challenged. You see, the Christian life is not about pretending that we've got it all together. In fact, we don't. And the fact is, it's the exact opposite. We're all in the same boat, all of us, all in the same hospital with the same sin sickness, all needing treatment, all in recovery. Some of us have just accepted the treatment that maybe Jesus is offering. It's kind of the difference. We're in the same boat. So if you feel this morning that there's no way I could become a Christian because I can't be perfect, it's a misunderstanding of what Christianity is about. In fact, some people will say, yeah, I, I don't want to become a Christian, it's because I know I can't be perfect. And I know if I can't be perfect, then that is going to be hypocritical, and I don't want to be hypocritical, therefore I don't want to be a Christian. And it's upside down, wrong kind of thinking. Because the very essence of what Christianity is about is people who recognize with their hands up to say, hey, guess what? I'm in the same boat. I'm not perfect. There's so many things in my life which are wrong. But do you know what? I'm in a process of change. You might say, look, I, I, 
I, I can't become a Christian because I'm carrying a load of baggage. Well, welcome to the club. You'd be struggling just like the rest of us. But Christians here to know that Jesus is working in them in a the process. Does that make me a counterfeit? Does that make me a fraud? Honestly, I, I looked back, I think, do you know what? I think I'm more like Jesus now than I was five years ago, and I'm more like Jesus now than I was ten years ago. And I reckon that is replicated across this room. There's many things in my life and many areas of my life that I'm not winning on, but I will win on them. One day I will conquer them. Why? Because I'm in a process of change. But I know that my life has changed. What would I be like if I didn't know Jesus? If I stop and if I rewound my life, where would I be? What would I be like? I reckon that I would be very different. I reckon that's not just me. I reckon that's replicated hundreds of times here in this room. It's why when a couple of weeks ago we can say, hey, do you fancy, uh, I know you don't have to give money and council tax break is really refreshing, but actually why don't you give an additional amount of money just so we can bless others and 45,000 pounds was given. Why? Because there's something in us that God's at work in us. It's a change. It's a process of taking place. And the thing is, we can't lose that process of a life that has been transformed. See, authenticity is about honest transparency. It's also about recognizing that lives are being transformed. A Christian life is not marked by perfectionism, but a Christian life is actually marked by transformation. It's a life that is under new management. And the genuine Christian, authentic Christian, is someone who puts his hands up to say, do you know what, I'm committing myself to that life change because I'm now following a different leader. A hypocrite is saying one thing and doing another because they don't care and they don't want to try. We can't ignore this process. So my illustration at the start with Mary, the gossiping Christian, and Sarah, the non-gossiping non-Christian, if we just take a snapshot, Snapchat moment, here's Mary, here's Sarah, and we look at it, and it only lasts eight seconds, and then it's gone, what is the lasting impression that we're left with? Well, we are left with a gossiping lady and a non-gossiping lady, and I want to be with a non-gossiping lady. What we don't realize is where Mary has come from. We don't know what Mary was like last year, 10 years ago. This issue of gossiping might be tiny in comparison to the fact that she was an axe-wielding murderer only months ago. And we have no idea, Sarah, who's the non-gossiping, non-Christian, what difference Jesus would make if she became a Christian because we don't forward project, we just get the snapshot moments. And there's many times we look at that snapshot and we go, well, I can't believe in Christianity or Jesus because look at that when we don't realize the transformation that is taking place in thousands and tens of thousands and millions of people's lives who are committing themselves genuinely to this process of becoming more like Jesus. Let me read you a story from the Bible. Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his home and a large crowd of tax collectors who, to be honest, were not liked like they are today. And he was having this group of tax collectors and the others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have come to call the righteous, those who are well, I'm sorry, I've not come to call the righteous, those who consider themselves to be well, but I've come to call the sinners, those who are sick, to repentance. And repentance is a life that has been turned around and transformed. What do we see from this story? This is it. Look, the people with a bad reputation were suddenly included. And the people with the good reputation, the moral, the upright, the religious, those who are hiding behind the mask, suddenly find themselves out in the cold. Now, if we follow that through, what do we end up with today in our society? It's an upside-down world full of misfits who can't quite believe their luck. It's like, like Charlie Bucket getting the golden ticket and getting an invite to the factory. It's a little bit like people who thought they had no way of getting in, totally undeserving, unmeriting. You just knew, if you only knew the rubbish in my life, there's no way suddenly finding ourselves in the position where we're not only invited, but we're donated the entire factory as well. That's pretty much the essence of the Christian faith. People who can't quite believe their luck that Jesus has come along and has invited us to the party. Now, as a result of that, the church community is honestly going to be messy. Why? Because it's filled up with messed up people. Welcome to the club. 
It's no wonder, therefore, that churches are filled with people who sometimes will say one thing and don't always mean it. And sometimes will act in one way that isn't always consistent with the Christian faith. Because of, that, because of the very nature of the people who come along. People who know they make mistakes, but also understand that they're on a journey into transformation. Christianity is not about perfection. Christianity is about understanding and recognizing that someone was willing to step into our life and to help us out of the mess we've got ourselves into. Sick people need doctors. We all need to remove the mask and get ourselves into recovery. Now, understandably, you might say, Graham, but it sounds like you're excusing and covering up bad and corrupt abusive behavior. I'm not. Some of the things that have been done are completely wrong. Many of the things. But I reckon that there's sometimes, there's behavior in your own life that you tolerate, but your intolerance towards other people's behavior. Let me illustrate that. When I'm in the car and I see people on mobile phones, I get very cross. And they go, I don't need to pop. And they signal backhand gestures similarly. <laughs> because I'm cross with them. They're putting me at danger, my family at danger, everyone at danger. Put your phone down. So I'm driving along, and a text message goes off on my phone on my front seat. Oh, I just have a little read of that and put it there. Because I tolerate behavior in myself that I don't tolerate in others. Let me illustrate it again. When I'm driving a car and someone's tailgating me, right? They're, they're like in the yard. I'm driving 50 miles an hour. I'm 50. It's 50. It's a 50 zone. I'm driving. 50. And look, look, look where they are. They're pushing me. They're pushing me all the time. Pressing the brake button, signaling to them again. And they signal back again. And uh, we're in that, in that place where I'm going, look, they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be doing that. Oh, it's terrible. And then I come along the same road and I'm now stuck behind a 25 year old, uh, not 25 year old, a 25 mile an hour driver. And I go, no, you should be driving quicker. Someone of your age shouldn't even be on the road. <laughs> Which was slightly more controversial than the nine o'clock meeting this morning, but however. <laughs> because I tolerate behavior in myself that I don't tolerate in others, where Jesus said it should be the other way around. Actually, you should be intolerant within yourself. You should be ruthless with it. You should up the game and become tolerant towards others. And yet somehow the church has flipped that around. We go, well, I might not be perfect, but you should be better than me. It's, no, 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 it's the wrong way around. I get intolerant, but I should be intolerant about my own behavior. Jesus actually raised the bar. He didn't lower it. Jesus said this, look, look you know how it says in the Old Testament you don't murder? Well, actually, guys, I'm raising the bar. I don't even want you to get angry. And, and do you know how it says in the Old Testament don't commit adultery? I don't even want you looking inappropriately at that girl as she walks down the street because it's as if you've already committed adultery in your heart. Jesus raised the bar. He didn't lower it. His expectations were higher, but at the same time, Jesus was not imposing upon us a perfectionism to something that we could not attain. He wanted us to be real within this. He raised the standards, told us to aim high, but at the same time, recognize we're on a journey of lives that are being transformed. See, I love the fact that Jesus had this reputation of, of loving sinners. Unfortunately, the church, again, has twisted that, that we love the righteous, we love those who get it right. And we discard and we push away the sinners. Jesus, I loved it. I love the fact that he had this bad reputation. I love us as a church to have a bad reputation like that. Because I would love us to be a community which is so overwhelmingly welcoming that anyone can come along and go, do you know what? There's a love within that community that just makes me want to go back to it. So what did a friend of sinners mean? Well, that didn't mean he loved a good party, hanging out and getting drunk. That didn't mean... He was more interested in simply showing love than taking sides. That didn't mean he, he always sided with the non-religious and the religious. And it didn't mean that Jesus just simply turned a blind eye. If we looked at the stories of Jesus, he loved, he welcomed, he embraced, and he corrected. He challenged people to change the way they behaved. Why? Because, you know, you continue to live like this, but that honestly isn't the best way of living. And somehow these people were not offended. They turned and they changed and they went about being transformed. There was something in the welcome and the acceptance and something in the, in the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God that helped them to become the person that they could be. How did people react? Well, some people absolutely changed. Others crucified him for it. Interesting that the chief supporters of the death of Jesus 
was the very people he was confronting with their hypocrisy. Jesus hated it. But it's so tragic that hypocrisy is so closely associated with his movement, the church. I reckon if we know forgiveness, we should show forgiveness. If we have experienced God's kindness, show kindness. If we understood acceptance, show acceptance. If we know that we are not judged, then don't judge. But honestly, some of you, this has not been your experience. Some of you have felt the heartache and the pain of being pushed away or rejected or abused by the church. And as a result, some of you have given up on the church because of these bad experiences. And because you've given up on the church, you've given up on Christ. Please don't. See, the real issue is Jesus, not the people who follow him. I grew up as a teenager in the 80s. The 80s was, for many of you here, just an unknown decade that is referred to. But one of the best groups of the day in the 80s, early 90s, was a band called U2. And one of the best songs, reportedly, that U2 ever wrote was a song called Pride in the Name of Love. Some of you are sitting here going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you're going, no, no, it's the best song ever. You need to listen to this song. It's just amazing. You've got Bono singing this song, and you've got, is it the edge on his guitar? And they're, they're competing for, for who gets the, you know, it's like, you've got to listen to this and look at this. Look, uh, uh, amazing. And then you hear that in a few weeks' time that the uh, local school is actually putting on an end-of-year school music concert, and one of the highlights is a group of 12-year-olds are going to be playing Pride in the Name of Love by U2. So you get very excited. This is the song that Graham has been going on about. I must go along and listen to this. How do you feel as you sit there with all your eagerness and anticipation on the front row and the group of 12-year-olds come and massacre and butcher this song (laughs) and you go away, you go, what on earth was that all about? Let me encourage you, there are tens of thousands and millions of Christians walking around playing a bad replica of who Jesus is. But please don't get put off by how we have failed because you need to listen and see the original. It's name Jesus. Don't give up. Don't judge the cover version alongside the original. You simply cannot compare. Some of you have been deeply wounded. Some of you have been very disillusioned. This hypocrisy is an easy excuse for you to turn away, but I hope you are smarter than that. See, Christians will disappoint, but Jesus won't. Occasionally, we will hit the right note, and occasionally you will get a glimpse of who he really is, and you'll catch that glimpse of how good the real thing is. His name is Jesus. So whatever's happened, whatever has gone on, whatever has caused such pain, And many of those things I honestly cannot excuse. But my plea today is look at Jesus, the original, and see what he's all about. One man came in the name of love. One man, come and go. One man came here to justify. One man to overthrow in the name of love. What more in the name of love? So Christian, let us pray. God, I thank you that we're standing here, a whole bunch of misfits and mistake makers who have understood something of the goodness and the grace and the generosity and the favor of God. None of us are here standing and we've got it. None of us are here making out as if we've got it all together. So I pray, oh God, that we'll be ever, forever grateful for all that you've done. It's immense, amazing grace in our life. And God, my prayer is this also for people here who are hurting, who are still carrying the scars of pain. And actually, there might be people here who say, do you know what, my objection is because of the church. Lord, I pray that they'll look beyond some of the poor imitations and they'll look to Jesus, the one who will never disappoint. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.